Great. OK. Um, I'm Johannes. Uh, I will talk about end-to-end -end question answering. Um, so in the beginning, I want to introduce you to a very widely used data set for question answering on text. That is the Stanford question answering data set. Um, this data set uh, contains examples like these. Um, you're given a text passage, for example, um, a Wikipedia article about precipitation, and you have a question about it. And the answer to that question appears as a span in that Wikipedia article. And the task is, uh, given this paragraph and a question about it, uh, predict the text span in the text uh, that uh, states the correct answer. Now, um, Squad is a huge data set, contains more than 100,000 examples. So this is amenable to deep learning methods. Um, it is a widely used benchmark data set. Uh, a lot of people have tried their methods on it. And um, again, this is an extractive question answering task, which is in contrast to other forms of question answering, like freeform answer generation or multiple choice question answering. Um, now there's a whole, a, a big list of other question answering data sets. This is really just one of them. Um, in case you're interested in this, uh, you can come back to this list uh, or talk uh, about, we can talk about this offline. Um, but back to Squad, um, what makes Squad interesting in the context of machine reading, as Sebastian said, is that we are really only given input-output examples. We're only given a text and a question, and um, there's no assumptions on how these questions can look like. And we only have this end-to-end -end annotation for that. So um, what people usually do is then um, uh, is to construct a neural model architecture somewhere here in the middle that is fully differentiable and can be trained end-to-end -end on these input-output examples. Uh, one particular architecture is QANet. That is a current state-of-the-art model here. And my goal uh, will be for you to understand, at least on a high level, how this architecture works uh, by the end of this section. Um, but in order to do so, um, we will uh, have a look at a simpler architecture that will be instructive on the way. So the simpler architecture is the attentive reader model uh, by Karl Moritz Hammond and colleagues, um, which in a sense can be uh, said uh, or understood as a, an early neural model for machine reading um, in the sense that uh, since then a lot of research in model architectures has happened. Um, nevertheless, many of the main components that we see in this uh, type of model are still used today, and we can find them in many other types of uh, machine reading models. OK, so probably this looks uh, a bit daunting right now, and I want to um, decompose this model architecture into several higher level components. Um, in the beginning, um, we have to talk a little bit about uh, the input representation. There's symbols and characters. However, neural networks work with vectors. How can we reconcile that? Um, after that, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can uh, put these words into co context of uh, one another. Um, and after we've done that both for the question and for the paragraph, um, we want um, some, some kind of matching to happen uh, because um, the text is relevant to the question and uh, we want to answer a question in the end. Um, and ultimately, we bring all of that together in an answer selection process. OK, let's have a look into each of these uh, individual components in some more detail. And we'll begin with representing symbols as vectors. So as I mentioned, the problem really is that we have something symbolic, um, like a character or a word, and we want to feed this into a neural network. And neural networks work with vector input. Um, so a naive solution for how we can, one could go about this is to construct something like a one-hot vector that is basically an indicator vector for any given word um, in a vector space that is as big as the size of the vocabulary. This is a really huge uh, uh, vector. can have uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of entries. Um, now, an obvious problem with this naive solution is that one-hot vectors like these do not represent any kind of relationship between different vectors. So uh, all one-hot vectors are orthogonal to one another. And in fact, um, these are really high dimensional and extremely sparse input. So it will be hard to train a model that generalizes across similar kinds of words, like say precipitation and rain, that have something in common. So ideally, in the best of all worlds, if we were to construct a vector representation for inputs, we would like to, look, uh, to have the representations for say rain and precipitation look very similar to one another. However, another word like mozzarella uh, would be completely different. Um, and 
Uh, that should be reflected in these uh, vectors as well. So similar meaning of words should be reflected in similar vector representations, ideally. How can we get there? And uh, in order to get there, we have to think a bit about uh, what word similarity is. Um, and there's an example that goes back to Marco Baroni um, uh, that says, uh, we found a little hairy wumpy mook sleeping behind the tree. So a wumpy mook is a completely made up word, um, but still you can somehow use the context around this word to think about what it could be. And this brings us to the distributional hypothesis that says that word that are uh, used and occur in the same context tend to purport similar meanings. Or the short version of this, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Okay, based on this idea that words are defined by the company that they keep, um, that means basically that two words are similar if they appear in the same kinds of documents. Uh, consequently, if we were to construct a kind of matrix uh, where we have all kinds of words as rows, and different documents as columns, um, and we would uh, list how often different terms appear in different documents, then we would see that uh, the respective row vectors for say precipitation and for rain would be similar. Um, however, rain would be dissimilar to uh, mozzarella because um, they appear in different kinds of documents. They have different types of contexts. Um, now, these would be other types, like this, this could be potential candidates for vector representations for these words. However, these are um, still very sparse representations. Um, and if we have a large number of documents, this is still very high dimensional. So combating this kind of sparsity, uh, a key idea here is that we can uh, approximate sparse matrices like this term uh, document coherence matrix uh, is um, that we can use low rank matrix factorization for this. Um, so we would decompose this uh, 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 sparse matrix into dense factor matrices for words and for documents. And the row vectors that we then find in this uh, lower dimensional uh, representations are uh, some kind of dense representations for each word. Um, which brings us to word embeddings. Um, Word embeddings are these dense vector representations for words of a lower dimensionality, like say 300. Um, and these word embeddings can capture word similarity to some degree, um, and they are usually pre-trained on a large text corpus. You can download these pre-trained embeddings on the web if you're working with text. Um, a very prominent model for this is uh, Wurtevec by Mikolov and colleagues. Um, I will talk a bit more about Wurtevec in a second, however, um, there's also different approaches uh, to constructing word embeddings, for example, uh, constructing them from the character level uh, upwards. Okay, so about word to vec, um, the idea behind word to vec, uh, also called skipgram with negative sampling, is that we want to maximize the similarity between co-occurring words, while at the same time minimizing the similarity between non-co-occurring words. So we would like to maximize the similarity between, say, rain and drop, or rain and precipitation, but rain and mozzarella should be very dissimilar, or rain and elephant as well. These should be minimized in terms of similarity. Um, and, based of this, uh, and based on this idea that we've seen previously, that uh, similarity should really mean collinearity of vectors, um, we can then say uh, two words are similar if their respective word vectors uh, have a large inner product. Um, and consequently, the sigmoid of that uh, would be close to one. And ideally, um, after training, vectors for rain and precipitation would point into a, same, a similar direction, whereas mozzarella would point into a different direction. Okay, um, when it comes to uh, um, training word to vec, um, one would take a, a word like rain and look at its local context. So say we have a, a sentence by collision with other raindrops or ice crystals. And around the word rain, we would construct this surrounding window. And during training, the goal would be to use these word vectors, uh, both for rain and from the words in its context, to predict the surrounding words that appear around rain. OK, implicitly, this is related to matrix factorization of the word context, pointwise mutual information matrix. But I won't in go into more detail about this. Um, 
what is interesting, maybe you've seen some of these visualizations before, is that the vectors that are learned this way have some interesting regularities. So um, these are two-dimensional projections of these somewhat high-dimensional vectors, um, but they still show that similar ty kinds of concepts like different cities or different body parts tend to cluster uh, close to one another in these learned vector spaces. And you will also find something like these translational symmetries. Uh, say you have a cluster of dif uh, or, uh, different types of countries, uh, there would be um, a kind of a standard direction that you have to traverse in vector space um, in order to get to the respective capitals of these countries. Uh, another interpretation of word vectors uh, or word embeddings is as uh, projections, linear projections from a v-dimensional discrete symbol space to uh, a lower dimensional, n-dimensional vector space, where we essentially perform a lookup operation uh, from the, the one hat vector in this uh, word embedding matrix. Okay, so back to our attentive reader model. We have now represented uh, words as vectors, and we are now ready to feed these vectors into a neural network model. So the next thing we will do is talk about composition. Um, and language, at a fundamental level, is compositional. Um, characters are put together into words, which then form phrases, clauses, or sentences, um, which are then put together into larger chunks of text like paragraphs and documents. Now, when trying to model this, there are a couple of challenges. Um, the question of what kind of composition function do we want to use? What is a good kind of bi uh, inductive bias that reflects the properties in language that we care about? Um, you could argue language is a sequence of words, so let's use a sequence-based encoder model. Or others might say, okay, language is grammatical, there's a syntactic hierarchy, we need a tree for that. Others say, oh no, uh, language is about the relationship between words, so we need some other kind of graph structure. Um, and all of this might actually vary uh, at different levels of this compositional hierarchy. Um, another problem uh, is capturing long-range dependencies. For example, co-reference resolution that Sebastian mentioned, tracking entities in text. Um, and finally, if we have an end-to-end -end differentiable model, it should be easy to train uh, this model, and gradients uh, should flow easily in this model, and um, that is another thing to keep in mind here. Now, representing words in context, uh, say we have these three different contexts, move from Gospitch to Prague, leave Gospitch for Prague, and leave Prague for Gospitch. The first of these two have a very similar meaning, uh, while the last one should, should be very different uh, in, in terms of vector space. However, um, if we were to purely look at the pre-trained word vectors for Prague, they would be the same for all three of these different contexts. So, Ideally, the word representations that we want should vary depending on the context, uh, context they're contained in. Uh, which brings us to contextual word representations. Contextual word representations uh, are word representations that are computed conditionally on the given context. Um, and they are formed as a composition of the word vectors uh, um, of the surrounding words. And um, what do you then get is these contextualized representations that really capture words in the context uh, around them. And there's different types uh, of composition function that you might opt for when combining uh, the word ve vector representations into the contextual representations. Uh, for example, recurrent neural networks. So uh, you would begin at the beginning of the sequence, uh, use this as a kind of sequence encoder uh, until you reach the end of the sentence. and um, the obvious idea here is that text is a sequence of words, and some prominent types uh, of um, this type of model are uh, LSTM, RG, or U models. Um, the inductive bias of this type of model is recency. And with that, I mean that the more recent a symbol is, the bigger its impact on the hidden state. Advantages of this uh, uh, model are that everything is connected uh, in the end, uh, when reaching the end of the sequence, and that it is easy to train and quite robust in practice. Many different NLP models use this type of composition function. Um, disadvantages are that um, it is relatively slow. You have to wait until the end uh, in order to compute the last uh, encoding for the last word, um, and for long sequences this can take uh, quite a while. Um, and it's not very good uh, for very long range dependencies due to the recency bias. In summary, this is a good model for sentences or small paragraphs. 
Um, there's also, I should know, tree-based variants of uh, uh, neural networks, uh, or recurrent neural networks, uh, like tree LSTMs or recurrent neural network grammars, um, which have a bias towards syntactic hierarchy, but I won't go into more detail about these here. Um, so now, uh, coming back to our attentive reader model, uh, we see that uh, an RNN is actually being used here, but it's a bidirectional RNN. One uh, of the um, two models goes forward and encodes the sequence at the beginning to the end, and the other one uh, walks backward. And this composition function is used both on the given text and also separately um, on the question that is given. Okay, with that, we are now ready to um, have a text and a question interact with one another. We want to match the text with a question. Um, so this is about modeling sequence interactions. Why do we want to do this? QA actually requires that we match uh, the question with the text. So this is, is very natural to the task. Um, and we want to condition text representations on the questions and potentially vice versa. So a naive approach for doing this would be to concatenate uh, the text and the question um, by putting the question at the end of the text and just encode all of that with a long recurrent neural network over the longer sequence. However, a problem with that would be that uh, what I mentioned previously with long range dependencies, there's many recurrent steps uh, between the answer potentially and the question in the end, so the signal might be hard to pick up on during training. Um, a better way is uh, modeling sequence interactions via, via attention. And what I mean with attention is um, relevance-weighted pooling of vectors across a sequence. Let's say that again. Relevance-weighted pooling of vectors across the sequence. Um, that is, we want to uh, combine the contextualized representations into a single vector representation. And we will do that uh, as, a, as a kind of linear combination, uh, a weighted linear combinations, and uh, the coefficients that we use to uh, add that together will, um, uh, will be normalized to one and between zero and one. So this can be interpreted as a kind of um, probability mask over the text. Um, and uh, we want this attention mask to uh, be computed conditional actually on the question representation and the text as well. So the question uh, now has something to say about what is relevant in the text and what is not. Um, and yeah, ultimately this determines the relevance of tokens for answering the given question then. Okay, so in our respective architecture here, this is going on on the left-hand side. These S1, Y1, S2, Y2, this is the attention aggregation that is happening. Um, so the attention-weighted sum of contextualized, contextualized word representations is computed in the variables R, and uh, later on, um, uh, the uh, representations both for the text and the question are combined into one single vector as a nonlinear function. Okay. Um, it's interesting if you look at the uh, attention patterns that uh, appear in, uh, over the text. So these are these kind of heat maps or probability masks over a text um, that determine how relevant the model thinks uh, any given word in the text is for answering the given question. Okay, so uh, now that we've matched the question with the text, uh, we're ready to put it all together and select uh, the answer or make a prediction. And this is typically done, uh, there's maybe still a linear projection happening, um, but then we want to compute a probability distribution over different answer options. And in particular for this kind of extractive question answering that I mentioned, uh, like in squad, we would have a distribution over positions for the beginning and the end of a sequence. In other settings, like say multiple choice question answering, we would now compute a probability distribution over the different candidates that there are. Um, this would be trained with cross entropy loss um, because all we really have is these end to end examples. We only know the desired label or the desired output. Okay, so this is the uh, kind of yeah, uh, attentive reader model and how we decompose it into individual components. And, um, at this point, it's probably also worth pointing out that there's other types of composition functions besides the RNN. Uh, the RNN we talked about, uh, but there's also, say, the convolutional layer. You might know convolutional neural networks from computer vision, but it's also useful for encoding text. Um, in fact, the idea behind would then be that text is a collection of n-grams, 
and the inductive bias is uh, a locality inductive bias, that only the words in the very local context around the word matter to determine uh, the context representation. Um, yeah, um, since it's uh, only a window, uh, a limited window, um, uh, only a limited number of words around it can have an impact on the current hidden state. An advantage of this uh, type of composition function, CNNs, is that it is parallelizable, and if one exploits that, one can make it very fast. This is something you can't do with RNNs. Um, however, a disadvantage is that, as I mentioned, you have this limited uh, context window around, um, and you can find a potential remedy for this if you stack CNNs into many, many layers on top of one another, and due to the dilation effect that you get from there, at some point you can also capture longer range dependencies with this. Okay, in summary, CNNs are good for character-based word representations, phrases, and multi-word representations. Um, uh, a final model, this is the, or a final type of composition function is the self-attention layer, which is kind of the new kit on the block. This is relatively recent uh, since this has been around. And the self-attention layer, uh, here the idea is that we have something like a latent graph on text, um, where uh, we have an inductive bias that really cares about the relationship between word pairs. And the composition function uh, on, on the bottom right here, you can see that really when you compute these com contextualized representations, they take all of the inputs uh, from the previous layer into account, not just from a local window. Um, and the idea, you've seen attention already, uh, is again to compute an attention mask over the text, uh, just not once, but k different times. So we compute k separate, weighted uh, token representations of the context. And we do that for every single token. Uh, yeah, and these are again these uh, weighted linear combinations according to some relevance score. Um, and these uh, are then all combined together, the k different uh, masks, and you compute the new contextual, uh, contextualized representation. Um, advantages of self-attention as composition function uh, are that it can capture really long range dependencies really easily. Um, the model a priori doesn't know whether uh, a, a token appears right next to it or far away, can capture long range dependencies this way. Um, it is also parallelizable and if this is exploited, can be made really fast. Um, however, disadvantages are that one has to be somewhat careful with setting up hyperparameters for this model and uh, it can be quite expensive for, say, longer text because the number of connections grows quadratically with a uh, uh, the text size, so if you go beyond the level of paragraphs or beyond the level uh, of documents, uh, this, this can grow uh, out of bounds. Um, okay, in summary, uh, self-attention uh, is good for phrases, or sentences, or paragraphs. Okay, looking a bit more closely at self-attention layer, um, we have uh, this graph uh, with weighted edges of different types, and it can capture, interestingly, uh, things like coreference chains or other syntactic dependency structures in text. Um, and I have some pointers for you in case you're interested about that in, in this. And um, there's this uh, blog post uh, by Google AI about the attention patterns that are learned by the a particular architecture, the transformer architecture, um, that also uses this kind of self-attention and how these attention patterns look like uh, for one particular example, um, which uh, is the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. And this is a case where we need to do some coreference resolution and figure out what it refers to. Is it the animal or is it the street? And uh, the model attends over the animal. However, if we then change the sentence and say, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide. So that's a, a different sentence. And wide, uh, in this context, it refers to the street now. Um, now more attention happens uh, on um, on the street token. So implicitly some kind of coreference resolution seems to be going on here, but this is still not very well understood. Uh, Self-attention is used in many state-of-the-art uh, machine reading models. It's used in language modeling and other NLP tasks, and there's various different flavors of self-attention that I won't go into more detail here. Um, now, we've talked about different composition functions. Um, they can, of course, also be stacked into deeper uh, networks. Um, and usually pure recurrent neural networks aren't very deep, um, and this is partly due to the fact that uh, some of the depth of recurrent neural network already comes naturally because you have this sequential processing, so there's yeah, a lot of computational depth already in there. Um, but uh, CNN-based models can be very deep. So this QANet architecture that we 
uh, had a look at, or we'll have a closer look at in a second, uh, actually has dozens of layers. And it needs uh, residual or highway layers um, to avoid the vanishing gradient problem. Um, yeah, and one final thing to keep in mind here is that self-attention is usually applied after uh, layers of CNN or recurrent neural network on already somewhat contextualized word representations. Okay, um, we're now ready to have a look at the QA net. This is a current state-of-the-art model that, uh, when ensembled, gets the best performance that there is on the squad data set. And with our kind of toolkit that we have in mind, uh, or that we have developed, um, we are able to decompose this architecture into the components that we've seen previously. Again, this architecture has to represent inputs as vectors. It then has to combine them and contextualize them. And it also has to do matching between question and text, just like the attentive reader had to. And finally, also this has to put all of this together in the end and uh, predict the span. So on a high level, um, the components that are being used in these architectures are very similar. Um, the concrete details are somewhat different though. The, uh, uh, QANet architecture uses a different kind of composition function that is made of these blocks that contain convolutions and uh, self-attention and uh, another feed-forward neural network, and it uses many of these, as many different layers, uh, or many uh, concatenations of these blocks on top of one another. Uh, when it does this interaction between question and context, it does this in both ways, and um, yeah, there's, there's dozens of uh, layers in total that are concatenated in this model. Um, yeah, so this is the, on a high level the QANet architecture, and um, it's, as you notice, probably extremely deep um, with dozens of layers, and uh, it doesn't use RNNs at all, uh, which makes it parallelizable and uh, somewhat faster to train. Um, it is currently the best model on squad um, for, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question for why it is actually the best model. One reason, I think, is that it uses self-attention, which has been found to be useful for many different uh, reading comprehension tasks. Um, uh, it also employs some sort of data augmentation that helps it, and because it is actually parallelizable and uses a CNN rather than an RNN, it is uh, faster to train and easier to tune. Okay, so at this point, uh, we have gathered all of the ingredients that are necessary to build a state-of-the-art supervised machine reading slash question answering system. We now know about how we can represent words with and without context, and how to model compositionality in language. Um, we have talked about modeling interactions between sequences, say the question and the paragraph, and um, we know that we can predict an answer uh, by giving a score to a starting point and an end point in a text. These architectures that I talked about work relatively well in practice so long as one stays in domain and the questions are relatively simple. Now, I want to move on to a next section, but uh, before we go, uh, yeah. Um, We've seen quite impressive uh, improvements um, of model performance on Squad since its release uh, two years ago. And at the beginning of this year, there was this magic point when the first model got a performance number uh, that was higher than a humanly recorded performance number. And back then, um, there was a lot of excitement in the media that uh, computer AI is now, uh, it can now read better than you can do. Um, which, of course, um, yeah. <laughs> Leaves us with the question, is reading comprehension now solved? Are we done? Can we go home? Um, and to give you like a bit more concrete answer about this, I want to give you a quick demo. So um, say we have uh, Ricardo's website. This is uh, his um, uh, biographical details. And um, we're going to ask some questions about it. Um, and we're uh, going to use the um, uh, CAPE plugin, it's a Chrome plugin. Um, if you are interested, we can talk about this later on offline. Uh, but it also uses a, a model that is trained on the squad data plus some additional data. So we can ask um, the model, uh, say, um, when um, did Ricardo um, do two his zero two zero seven six seven nine two thousand and five. 2005. Okay, so Ricardo got his PhD from the newly formed machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University in 2005. So the, the model got that right. Um, could also ask a question like, where did Ricardo go, uh, do his PhD? Carnegie Mellon University. 
okay, that works okay. Um, we can also ask something like, uh, when did uh, Ricardo uh, fall in love? Two, 2005. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure if it's true. Uh, maybe the model got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or we could ask a uh, 2005 when did Sebastian fall in love 2005 um, okay so you can see um, the model really likes 2005 in fact um, when you just remove all of this here and just ask when 2005 the model will still say 2005. So it has learned that uh, in order to make good predictions, it, it needs to figure out that um, these years typically are answers to when questions. But um, it doesn't really know if a question is actually answerable or not from the paragraph. Um, uh, when did... Um, 2005. <laughs> 2010. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs> okay, so in fact, it, it can't really do that, uh, as you can see, which is an interesting observation. Right, yeah, this is something that Sebastian also touched upon. Um, it's an interesting point, yeah. Okay, so back to our presentation. Um, you should, I mean, if you want, you can play around with this plugin. It's, it's free to download and play around with. Um, but I want to continue now uh, with where reading comprehension models actually work today and where they don't work. So they work well when the question is answerable, when the relevant text is given, um, when it is not too long, and when inferring the answer is not too complex. So um, that is because these models really learn to do pattern matching and to do some sort of soft text alignment between the question and the text, as we have just seen with a negative formulation of the question. Um, and we also require that there's some domain overlap at training and at test time. Now, uh, upon closer look at these uh, neural network ar architectures and how they behave, we find an interesting phenomenon. Say, we have this example, this is from the squad data set. What is the name of the quarterback who was 38 in Super Bowl 33? And the model will get that right. However, if you then append another uh, particularly chosen sentence afterwards, um, like quarterback Jeff Dean had a jersey number 37 in champ ball 34. The model is thrown off completely and predicts Jeff Dean. And it turns out that there is some systematicity to that uh, and that reading comprehension models, uh, in fact all of them that uh, are trained on squad, can easily be fooled by these kinds of uh, adversarial sentences that are appended at the end of a paragraph. Um, that leaves us with the question whether all of this model complexity, all of these uh, deep layers that we talked about, is actually necessary. Especially uh, in face of the fact that relatively or somewhat simpler models are actually still competitive on squad. Uh, nevertheless, also they have problems with these kind of adversarial examples. Uh, so should we rather build model architectures more carefully, more uh, think more about these types of composition function, does that matter? or? should we think more carefully about our training data in the first place that we're using? And um, that brings us to uh, making these models more robust. Uh, and 
uh, one way for um, making them more robust is actually focusing on the solvability of questions. Um, a recent extension of the Squad dataset, Squad 2.0, um, is uh, augmenting this dataset with examples that cannot, in fact, be answered. Um, so you might have a question uh, about a name of the 1937 treaty, and this question cannot be answered from this paragraph here, even though names of other treaties are mentioned in there. So this makes it particularly easy to throw models off um, but ideally, the models should um, predict that uh, um, this question is unanswerable. And in fact, if you take some of the models that scored really high previously uh, on the Squad 1.1 version, um, their model uh, performance will uh, deteriorate quite drastically when uh, tested in this new setting with unanswerable questions. Okay. So there's also other kinds of adversarial examples for training or regularization. And the high-level idea here is that we want to make models adhere to some kind of high-level rules. Um, and these rules can either be appending sentences uh, and some form of knowledge-based rules, like the adversarial examples I just showed you. But there's also adversarial rules like uh, erasing words, and that can flip model predictions. Or um, character flips, flipping individual characters, and that throws models off. Um, adversarially chosen paraphrases, or even semantic equivalences like, uh, say you change from British English to American English and suddenly the model gets it wrong. And uh, another way uh, um, is uh, actually looking at KB rules that are violated by uh, model predictions. Most of these approaches use data augmentation strategies in order to become robust against these failure cases. Um, the last example uses some form of adversarial uh, regularization um, where during training time the model would look at the cases that are most violated, um, uh, that most violate a knowledge base rule. Okay, um, another way to uh, make models more robust is model diagnostics. Maybe the models are right for the wrong reason. Uh, so we have to understand a bit better what do models actually rely on when they form their predictions. Um, there's interesting work uh, by uh, Ribeiro and Alvarez, uh, Melis and Jacola. Um, about analyzing sensitivity to specific inputs. Um, but um, a diagnostic model that I want to focus here on uh, is the ANCAS model by Ribeiro from this year. And the idea of the ANCAS model is that we want to find a minimal set of sufficient conditions that the model uses when it makes its prediction. As an example, um, this is from a visual question answering task, and the diagnostic model, ANCAS, is actually task agnostic. Um, we have a question like, what is the mustache made of? And the correct answer is banana. Um, but it turns out that the word what is an anchor for this example. That means it is sufficient, uh, uh, so long as what is present, the model will always give the prediction banana. So you might even ask, what is the man made of? And the model will say banana. Or you might have a different question, like how many bananas are in the picture? And um, the anchor for this is many. So the presence of many is sufficient for predicting two, even if you have a question like, how many zebras are there in the picture? So these type of diagnostic models are really important for us uh, when, one, when we want to shed insight uh, onto these deep methods that are otherwise quite opaque. Uh, finally, another way to make models more robust against these failure cases is using pre-trained representations. So this is our uh, uh, question answering setting. We have a neural net encoder. Uh, for our QA task. However, we might just as well pre-train this kind of uh, compositional encoder model on lots of text, say with a language modeling objective, and then lift over the representations that we learn there from the compositional sequence encoder into our QA task. So we would take a pre-trained language model um, that is trained on plenty of text and transfer that into a QA setting. Um, we see that these pre-trained sequence encoders improve natural language understanding tasks significantly. Um, there's uh, several publications that came out this year that uh, showed uh, quite robust improvements across different tasks with these pre-trained sequence encoders. Um, and besides language modeling, people have also used these pre-trained representations from tasks like machine learning, or uh, sorry, uh, machine translation, or natural language inference. And it's an interesting question what other kinds of tasks we could use uh, in order to pre-train our representations. Okay, so you might wonder how is all of this uh, different from pre-trained word embeddings, um, like word to vec. Um, and the difference is that pre-trained word embeddings alone predict um, 
uh, co-occurring word pairs independently uh, of other contexts, whereas pre-trained contextualized representations, like say the Elmo model, um, uh, uses the entire text and captures uh, or tries to capture as much of the dependence uh, on other contexts as possible. Okay, in summary, the directions for improving model robustness, we saw that task refinement is quite important, uh, training the model to do the thing that we actually care about. Um, diagnostics, looking into the failure modes of the models and uh, adversarial training and regularization. And finally, better prior models for contextualized representations. Besides these directions for making models more robust, um, we have some other challenges ahead of us. Um, the first one being limited supervision, uh, where we saw strong results uh, with our neural nets uh, when we have large annotated training sets. However, how does the situation look like when this is not the case? Say we want to shift from 100,000 annotated training examples to only 1,000. And this would also remove the need for this large scale costly annotation of the data set. Um, approaches for this include domain adaptation, uh, training uh, on one data set and trying to transfer that to a data set in a separate domain. Um, synthetic data generation, um, uh, basically generating questions and then using these synthetic questions to uh, train a model that is also trained on actual questions. Um, or transfer learning, looking at individual tasks that might be beneficiary uh, for uh, training a question answering system. And also these unsupervised uh, sequence encoder representations uh, like the ELMO model that I talked about a second ago. Uh, a second challenge is integrating background knowledge. So you might have a sentence like, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. And who was wearing the pants? Was it me or was it the elephant? Uh, how is a model supposed to know that? For us, it's clear implicitly that elephants can't fit into human pants. But uh, yeah, a, a, a model really lacks the missing context or background knowledge in, in order to make this kind of inference. Um, yeah, there's different approaches for doing, uh, for incorporating background knowledge. Um, they center around including encyclopedic descriptions or uh, also perhaps uh, information from common sense knowledge bases. And um, an example uh, uh, is work by Dirk Weissenborn from last year where um, they uh, condition context representations also on additional facts from a common sense knowledge base. And the intuition behind is that these new background facts can provide additional features for these contextualized representations and we get refined vector representations for words. Okay, third challenge is uh, integrating uh, machine reading with vision. Um, for example, in visual question answering. And this is really because uh, we have now fully end-to-end -end differentiable uh, models for machine reading, including end-to-end -end trainable encoders for questions and for text. Um, and if we try and uh, classify different computer vision tasks according to uh, the question that they represent in terms of natural language, uh, we would say object recognition, that is, what is in the image? Or segmentation, where are the things in the image? Might move on to scene or attribute classification that is somewhat more complicated, like what color is the dress? Um, but visual QA really is at the end point of this where you can ask arbitrary questions. In order to pass these arbitrary questions, we, need, we probably need these uh, um, text encoders that we uh, developed in machine reading. And an example task is the VQA challenge by Goyal et al. Um, that uh, poses in interesting questions like, is the umbrella upside down or not? And you really need to uh, develop an uh, understanding of the text here to uh, answer the question. Um, yeah, OK. So um, another challenge is scaling things up. Um, so far, we've only seen um, machine reading systems work on individual paragraphs. But say in an application like open question answering, where you come up with a random question like, in which year did Monterey become part of the United States, uh, it's not even clear what text to work with. So we need something like a search engine that then, say, looks at Wikipedia and gives us a couple of articles, which are then fed into a machine reading system. Um, Finally, a, a really tough challenge um, is reconciling conflicting information. Sebastian already touched on that. Uh, say you have different claims about uh, how much money the UK pays to the EU every single week. And it's very difficult to reconcile that even as a human. So some factors that might play a role here are the trust into the source or the timeline when things were published. But this is a really tough problem. <coughs> 
And then um, there's another challenge that is reasoning with text. So we might have a question like, which medical specialty deals with uh, this type of ACTH hypersecretion, um, which is a medical condition? And um, we have a text that relates this ACTH hypersecretion to the anterior pituitary. But um, a second document only tells us that the anterior pituitary is part of the endocrine system. And the third document tells us that the field of study that deals with the endocrine system is endocrinology. So that way, we connect um, the question to an answer across several documents. And this is really tough. And it's currently not clear what types of uh, models or methods we need in order to solve that. Whether we want to use some kind of knowledge base representation that uh, Sebastian introduced and uh, do information extraction and then maybe apply some rules to do inference, or whether we want to just uh, concatenate all of that, uh, feed it into a neural network, and hope for the best. Or whether we want to do something in the middle, where we have maybe still some type of graph, graph rep representation, but now also with uh, um, vector representations for the nodes and edges in this graph, it's at that point not very clear uh, how best to solve this problem. Um, in conclusion, um, we've talked uh, about this paradigm shift that has been going on uh, from symbolic meaning representations to latent vector representations, uh, where in the traditional uh, approaches, one would do mostly feature engineering and need domain expertise uh, about, say, entity linking. And now we're mostly doing architecture engineering, and people would need machine learning or deep learning expertise. Um, back in the days when people would do automatic knowledge base construction, um, advantages of these structured representations uh, would be that you have fast access. Um, it's scalable. Um, the, uh, the representations that you get are interpretable. You can have a look at these graphs and see if they make sense. Um, they also support uh, formal reasoning. And we have some sort of universality of the representations that we have there. So um, with that, I mean that these representations are independent of actual questions one might pose about them. They're only developed from the text. Um, disadvantages of these structured representations are that they are less robust to variation in language, which is something that neural nets are very good at. Um, they have these cascading errors because it's usually pipeline approaches. Um, there's this schema engineering that is going on, Sebastian talked about, and uh, annotation when we want to construct training data sets actually requires experts. On the other world, uh, on the other side, we uh, saw end to end machine reading, um, where advantages are that we have. Uh, that they are more robust towards variation in language. Uh, we don't see these cascading errors anymore because everything is now trained from beginning to end in one step. Um, we don't have that much domain expertise required anymore, even though it's still useful. Um, we can potentially more easily integrate that with other domains, like in visual question answering. And also, the annotation of data sets for this task is much easier because it doesn't require uh, domain experts in order to formulate question answering pairs. So that can be scaled up uh, via crowdsourcing more easily as well. Disadvantages of using distributed representations are that uh, it's less scalable. Uh, it's computationally more heavy. Um, we have uh, a data efficiency problem in that it's very training data hungry when we want to train these models. Uh, we have a lack of interpretability. Um, the distributed vector representations are opaque, and you can't really understand what they represent. Um, there's no explicit and direct support for reasoning. And um, the representations that we learn this way are usually not universal. So the representation will change depending on the question that we're asking. Um, so in our typical question answering setting, uh, the dependence uh, of the representation of the meaning here would really be conditioned on the question that we actually pose. However, with these pre-trained sequence encoders, we now actually see that this link has been removed. And we, we kind of get these uh, uh, representations of text um, that are trained unsupervisedly and uh, that can then be interfaced uh, uh, with different questions. So to some extent, we see uh, some form of synthesis in that these um, uh, representations are also becoming more universal and independent of questions. Uh, overall, if you have ideas for tackling these disadvantages here, there's great research opportunities. And um, yeah, with that, I want to conclude. I have uh, lots of references, by the way, in case you, you want to have a closer look into these. Great, thank you.